have manufactured controversies, uh, done stunts, planted fake stories. Hi, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer for Reason TV. I'm here with Ryan Holiday, author of the new book, Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator. He's also been a media strategist for clients like Tucker Max, and he is the current director of marketing for American Apparel. Ryan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. In your book, one of your main focal points is that blogs are really dictating what's news right now and feeding the top news dogs instead of the other way around. Why, why do you think this is? The online cycle drives the offline cycle. And the reason for that is, is where do, if you're a media producer, you're a radio producer, you're a, a television show host, you're a researcher, where are you finding out the things that you're going to talk about in your nightly or, or daily broadcast? You're not out like pounding the pavement like, sitting in some bar like you know listening for gossip you're on the internet like everyone else the mainstream media outlets have sort of taken on the role of popularizers so they see what's being talked about on the internet and then they say hey we've got a bigger audience we're going to take this thing and we're really going to blow it up if this is what everyone's talking about that's what we need to bring to our users and so what happens is that things start on the internet for whatever reason and then the next thing you know they're on CNN. And you make the claim that because blogs have an infinite amount of space to fill, you know, the bar lowers for what the, the quality of their content. But because a lot of the mainstream news outlets have a lot of their content coming from online as well, isn't the bar lowered across the board? Absolutely. I mean, we, we've always sort of joked about how having to fill a 24-7 cycle makes cable news just talk about total bullshit. Well, what if it was a infinite cycle. And yeah, like Fox News can throw up a blog post and depending on the response to that blog post, decide whether they want to popularize it through their radio assets, through their television assets, through whatever other means they have. You do make it seem like it's a bad thing, but at the same time, there's also an infinite number of watchdogs for people sitting at home on their couch instead of just a few people in the New York Times newsroom. Though there are more critics they pale in comparison to the power of the machine to just generate ideas and spread narratives. But it doesn't matter because those narratives take hold online and they spread so fast that it almost doesn't matter what someone says an hour later proving that it's not true. But don't you think it allows more voices to be heard and once someone is not accountable or credible anymore, people won't read them? Every day it's kind of a fresh start on the internet. Whoever is publishing the thing that's the most interesting is what we're going to read and click. You don't pay any money to the Huffington Post, so they don't owe you anything and you don't really owe them anything. And they know that they can get you back after they've burned you by publishing some other crazy thing that you have to click. So it's like you read some crappy, you know, like naked celebrity slideshow and it turns out to be like an exaggeration or not true and you're disappointed. Okay, you leave, but you can't take back your clicks for starters. And then the next time you see a headline that big, you're probably going to click anyway because what's the cost to you? It's nothing. It's just a click. And they sell that click to advertisers. There's only a like button. There's no dislike button. And that, because of that, there's no real loyalty on either side of the equation. And that diminishes the need to, to deliver a quality product. And let's talk about your own manipulation, yeah. uh, if you can talk about your experience with Tucker Max. Uh, I've manufactured controversies, uh, done stunts, planted fake stories, um, done everything from edit, edit Wikipedia pages and see how journalists repeat what they just find on Wikipedia. If you send an anonymous tip that's too good to be true, it's going to get published because there's no consequences for it turning out to be untrue. So for Tucker, one of the big things we did was it was a movie primarily for young adult males. What you doing? I'm talking to the turtles. Are they telling you to kill that fat girl behind us? Because that's what they're telling me to do. There are obviously people who don't like those types of movies. So instead of sitting back and saying, okay, we're not going to be able to reach those people. They're, they're a non-entity in this campaign. We thought like, how can we get those people to denounce the movie and talk about it and spread the word about it in a way that makes young adult males want to go see whatever they're saying that they shouldn't go see. And so uh, part of the campaign involved um, like buying really controversial, deliberately provocative billboards that I went out and vandalized and then leaked photos of to blogs, real protests generated from, from my fake stunt to the, to the degree in which um, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune both wrote editorials denouncing the movie. The city of Chicago banned our advertisements. 
feminists in New York City vandalized the billboards. Sort of on that note, um, with experts, I mean, with the 24-7 news cycle, they're always looking for quote-unquote experts to comment on their stories. Do you think this is allowing for more people to be heard? A absolutely. I mean, one of the things I did with the book is um, there's this service called Help a Reporter Out. And basically, it's like a, it's a social network where reporters and journalists who are and, and producers who are looking for sources post like, hey, I need an expert on cats. And then someone says like, I'll be your cat expert. And then um, they, they sort of trade. They say, look, I'll give you information for your story if you publicize me and whatever I'm promoting. I spent about six months pretending to be an expert, answering every query that I could. And I ended up being quoted on everything from vinyl records to boat winterization, uh, to politics, to uh, like evolutionary psychology to fitness. And I got quoted in all these things and no one bothered to check my identity. No one bothered to Google me and find out that I'd written a book about media manipulation. And I ended up getting quoted um, the New York Times, ABC News, the Today Show, pretty much every major name in media uses the service and they ended up biting on the fake leads that I was doing. You know, you, you've said a lot of problems, but compared to, you know, 30 years ago when we had three uh, gatekeepers dictating everything we know, which is better? I mean, don't, don't we have a lot more opportunities now? Look, there's no question. I think it's, it's great that people have access to publishing in a way that they've never had before. But, you know, there's the law of unintended consequences. And, and what that's done in this case is just make misinformation a lot easier. And we haven't really, we, we've embraced this new technology, but we haven't erected any defenses or made any changes or changed how we, how we consume the news, how we believe what we read based on these changes. People want the crappy journalism. I mean, that's, that's their choice. It's not, it's not up to us to say you can only have this golden story. Of course, and, and I think, look, there's certainly a problem with very um, indulgent journalism for a while too, which is like journalists writing about things that other journalists care about and not the public. So there's obviously a mix, but it's, it's hard to say that like, oh, people only click crap when we only give them crap. And then we, it sort of, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like, I think we have to have like a real frank conversation about what's happening. I think there's so much cheerleading going on that no one wants to look at the bad stuff. Like there's, there's a sort of the old generation of journalists who just like hate everything on the internet because it's like threatens their job. And then there's the sort of like the Jeff Jarvis, like tech guru crowd who just loves anything that the internet produces. And it's like, look, the, the internet won, like it's over. The internet is the future of, of news. Well, now that that's the case, how are we gonna run things? Ryan, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me. For Reason TV, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer. Hi.